For active galaxies, we found several different types. Um, right now, I'll just discuss the main types. The most powerful, meaning the most luminous type, is the quasar, or today what we often call a QSO, quasi-stellar object. I'll explain the reason for the different terms in a moment. Uh, there's the quasar, the most powerful. There, is, there are radio galaxies, uh, and there are Seifert galaxies, S-E-Y-F-E-R-T, uh, which is named for Carl Seifert, their discoverer. Let me give you something about the discovery of these first. Seiferts were probably discovered first, 1943. Carl Seifert, working at Vanderbilt University, was studying uh, spiral galaxies when he noticed that the some of these had unusually blue cores, or nuclei, the centers. Unusually blue colors. Also, they were unusually bright, and the cores displayed broad emission lines. Now, in galaxies, we... Let's see, you can get uh, there are three basic kinds of spectra. There's a continuum spectrum, which uh, in galaxies is generally going to come from the uh, uh, star's black body radiation. There are absorption spectral lines superimposed on that. It comes from cooler gas uh, surrounding the stars or through the interstellar medium, um, dust and other things. And galaxies generally display this con a broad continuum from black body with absorption lines superimposed on it. You can get emission lines in galaxies, but those mostly come from nebulas and from around star-forming regions. And so you get these very narrow, sharp spikes of emission lines. But what Sievert was finding was that at the cores of what are now called Sievert galaxies, they were very broad emission lines. Now, the, the reason for the, the width of these wasn't really clear at the time. Uh, it could imply motion of the sources so that you get uh, Doppler broadening, some things moving towards you, some things moving away from you, and this in fact turns out what it is. Uh, or you could have just very high temperatures, in which case the individual gas molecules some are moving towards, some are moving away. The hotter the gas is, the faster the molecules move, and the broader the lines would get. That would be a thermal broadening. Both of these come from the Doppler effect. Now, so those were Seifert galaxies. Generally in spirals, unusually bright blue cores or nuclei, and showing broad emission lines. Now, around, well, let's say, after World War II, the 1950s, uh, radio astronomy was really picking up. Now, optical astronomy had been everything that astronomy was uh, until you had uh, radio startup. And so when you first start looking at the sky with radio telescopes, the first thing you want to do is to map out the entire sky, probably at low angular resolution, at, at uh, low quality pictures, to get a general idea of what's out there. Then you can follow up on the interesting things with a more precise uh, measurements, uh, sharper pictures. So they were surveying around, and they started noticing that there were, well, the sun. The sun is the brightest radio-emitting object in the sky. Jupiter, surprisingly, is, I think, generally second brightest. Uh, you get some emission from uh, ions coming out of the moon Io uh, interacting with Jupiter's magnetic field, and it produces some fairly easily detectable radio waves. Outside of that, you've got a few things in the Milky Way, and then you get things which we know now are outside the Milky Way galaxy. These are radio galaxies. Now, at the time, they weren't sure that these were really outside the Milky Way. They couldn't measure the distances to them too easily. <coughs> Although they had, back uh, about 1930, finally gotten Hubble's Law established and started finding out that, that you could measure... Um, things that were far enough away you could measure their distances fairly well. So, but they weren't sure that these other radio sources really were deep outside the Milky Way galaxy. About 1950, let me think here, um, about 51, according to my notes, there was detection, uh, there was a radio detection of uh, the galaxy Centaurus A. It's in the constellation Centaurus, the Centaur. And this bright radio source was found, and they were really debating the nature of this, what it was coming from. And the, uh, by the way, there was a, uh, 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 
a bottle of whiskey bet between some famous uh, astronomers on what the source of this radio emission was. So uh, it finally got established. It was coming out of uh, it was coming out of this this uh, galaxy. Now the radio galaxies, when they looked up at them with uh, high precision uh, pictures, they were noticing that radio galaxies were distinctive in having two jets of gas come out of the galaxy in opposite directions. And then you have these lobes, sort of ear-shaped, around at the end of each of the, one, one lobe around each, of the, each end of the jets. And so the uh, uh, radio galaxies tend to have sort of a dumbbell shape in radio. All right, so that's distinctive. The dumbbell shape, you can resolve, you can get a sharp picture of each of those uh, lobes. Now, by through the 1950s, by about 1960, a lot of radio surveys have been done. The third Cambridge radio su survey, um, the 3C catalog, well, they had some of these which they didn't have sharply resolved images of. They just had a, a single blob. You didn't have the dumbbell shape. and they weren't sure what they were coming from. Now, if you've got really low quality uh, um, angular resolution, a very blurry image, you'll need to find a way of sharpening it up. If you take a look at a star map, or for that matter, even a galaxy map, and you're trying to find what is the source of these radio waves, you've got to find a way of narrowing down the, uh, where the source is. Star maps and galaxy maps are pretty high precision. So, in 1962-63, Cyril Hazard, British astronomer, who, by the way, was one of my uh, uh, graduate, he was on my uh, dissertation committee, Cyril Hazard had figured out a way of narrowing down the location of one of these, uh, 3C273, the 273rd object in the 3rd Cambridge Radio Survey. And 3C273 was going to get eclipsed by the moon uh, two, three times. And so he went down to the, I think it was the Parks, I really shouldn't say this if I'm not sure, uh, but he went down to the radio observatory in Australia and was going to track the moon and wait until it eclipsed the radio source. So here you've got the moon coming on along, and you know very carefully where the moon is. And there's the edge of the moon. And here is, let me see, uh, get the hands right. So here's the moon, here is the, uh, the radio source here, and as the moon comes along, cuts that off, and your signal drops almost all at once. Well, you can draw a line in the sky around the edge of the moon on your map, or you know the source is somewhere on there. Uh, and then when the moon uncovers the source, it blinks back in, and then you can draw another line there, and where the lines cross, X marks the spot, that's where your source is. And they, they narrowed it down to what looked like a little faint blue 13th magnitude star with a little wisp of what was nicknamed a nebulosity coming out of it. Uh, looked like a jet. And they were getting radio sources from this star-like object and from the jet. And, well, okay, that, seemed, uh, that was pretty unusual. Now, the thing is that stars don't really put out much in the way of radio signals because, well, you look at the sun. Um, we can detect radio from it, but only because we're right up close to it. And the, th the stars are uh, th they're thermal, and so the black body radiation in the radio is way down at the long wavelength end. It's very, very weak. So we're not going to pick up much in the way of radio from really distant faint stars. So they weren't really sure about this. And when uh, they got the chemical spectrum of it, and got a distance measurement from the redshift, they found out it was the most distant object in the known universe. Because this, uh, what had been thought, talked about as a possible radio star, an unusual class of stars, because this turned out to be way, way outside the Milky Way galaxy, and they realized it was a distant galaxy or a distant something, um, it meant its luminosity was incredibly high. It was uh, much too powerful, we know now, to be powered just by a whole bunch of stars, even billions of them. It was just too bright for that. Now, this was what became known as a quasar. Quasar stands for quasi-stellar, meaning uh, unresolved, point-like, radio source. 
and we sometimes refer to them as QSOs today, quasi-stellar objects, because we realize now that most of them, in fact maybe only 10%, are really radio emitting or radio loud. There are the remaining 90% are radio quiet. They don't produce much in the way of radio waves for reasons I'll get into.